So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our session on what customers want the BFSI and FinTech edition. Um, we have a great panel with us today, uh, but before we jump into introductions, we just wanted to say, you know, we have a few poll questions that will pop up during the session. We'd love it if you could interact with those. And uh, we have a Q&A widget that, you know, you can leave your questions in and then, you know, we'll answer them once uh, we're done going through the discussion. Um, so, you know, to, the conversation is structured in a way that we will start off with a 30 minute conversation followed by the live Q&A, um, where, you know, the panelists will be happy to answer any questions that you have for them. Anything that we cannot answer now, we'll reach out to you later with some answers. So without further ado, let's meet the panel. So Mario, why don't you get us started and share, give us a short introduction. Thanks, Nandita. Hi, everyone. My name is Mario Volante. I work at Freshworks as a customer success manager. So I've been at Freshworks for a year and a half. Previously, I worked at a company called Answer IQ, which was acquired by Freshworks in January of 2020, so that Freshworks could improve their offerings in machine learning and artificial intelligence. My work history is a little bit broad, so I've worked in a few startups, I've worked for nonprofits, and I've also worked in investment banking for operations. So I'm excited to join the panel today and share my thoughts. Thank you, Mario. Justin? Thank you, Nandita. Hi, everyone. I'm Justin Cruz. I'm a director on the customer success team at Medallia. Uh, previously worked for a solution, Stella Connect by Medallia, which was acquired in September. Worked at Stella Connect for about five plus years. So through those years, working with lots of financial institutions, retail banking and fin uh, fintech companies that really cared about gathering customer feedback to drive coaching, quality assurance and recognition programs. So excited to share that experience today and take part in the conversation. Thank you all. Thank you, Justin. So Hey, hi, Nandita. Yeah, uh, my name is Suhas Gujarati. Uh, I work with Zozode. I am responsible for the North American business. Uh, essentially, the role involves, uh, you know, uh, key account management and relationship management. And previously, we also used to call this as engagement management. So being in BFSI sector for quite some of uh, my career, it's interesting to see what kind of uh, questions we get today and, uh, you know, share the experience that we have. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you once again to all our panelists for joining us here today. Um, so let's get started with our conversation for today. So, you know, just to kick things off, we, we want to talk about like, what is the biggest change that we've all kind of observed in customer expectations and behaviors in the last 12 months? This is also a, a poll question for our attendees. So if you could let us know what you've seen as well. Um, so some data that we've looked around that suggests, you know, that customers today are interacting with businesses that give them more personalized experiences, right? They're willing to leave one business and go to another if they know that they're going to get more personalized experiences and amazing support, right? And if you look at it, we also see that consumers now want to have access to their financial service providers online at all times throughout their entire customer journey. So, you know, to dive a little bit more into that, we also have a couple of key uh, customer trends or that we've noticed, you know, even pre-pandemic, which are primarily, you know, that they're attracted to low-cost offerings and they seek ease of use, they want faster service, they want uh, better, <clears throat> sorry, better features, and they want more personalized products. So, I'm going to pose this question to our panelists, and you can also see the results that we have from our attendees today. What have you really seen as new uh, behaviors or new trends or new expectations that customers have? From what we can see, you know, customer expectations are at an all-time high, but CSAT scores are not that great. So what do you think is the cause for this? Over to all of the panelists. Anyone can pick it up. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to start. Yeah, and, and I saw in the poll, a lot of people are saying it's all of the above, privacy, mm -hmm. ease of access. And so there's definitely a culmination of over the last year with everything that everyone has been through in their personal lives with the, with the pandemic and the change of, of scenery and, and life. Definitely when you work with new, new brands and, and new companies, you want to make sure you feel safe with your data, right? And making sure your, your information is taken care of, but also service is a major differentiator now, right? And so mm -hmm. um, every time you interact with this brand, how are they taking the time to 
to have empathy for your issues, to, to listen to what you're looking for, but also be proactive. And those are now those differentiators because, because of more uh, options out there from the traditional options, even just a couple of years ago, um, that's what's gonna separate the companies. And I think uh, the expectations and the, the focuses there um, are making sure that they're feeling a personalized experience, that they can have their data be secure and, and privacy, um, but also ease of access, not making it too hard because there's a lot of people that are shifting into a digital world that were previously not used to that. They're used to brick and mortar, doing things in person. And so it, it really is that culmination. So seeing the poll respond that way, I think aligns to, to how we all view it. But Suhas or Mario, love your thoughts there too. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the trends that we have definitely seen is where customers are more demanding in terms of, uh, you know, do it themselves kind of uh, features uh, with what they are asking for. So more self-service options today. Um, so they need super smart, uh, you know, interview kind of chatbots and, you know, whatever self-service options that we can provide them. That's definitely something that we have observed in our world. I think everything that Suhas and, and Justin said uh, is, is what we're feeling too at Freshworks. Um, one thing to touch on that Justin mentioned about the empathy is I've seen a lot of, of larger companies start to either forgive or reduce um, some fees, whether it's overdraft fees um, or various other fees that people are experiencing because a lot has changed over the last 12 months and people are in situations they haven't been in before. So finding a unique way to show that empathy, right? And reducing or forgiving a fee for the first time while also maintaining your operational costs, you know, can be tricky, but we see a lot of creative ways that companies are doing that and customers are responding positively. Makes sense, yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, just want to touch upon that. You talked about how, you know, we're going more of that people are more digitally savvy, right? So we wanted to understand like, what is the role of digital CX in financial services spaces today? Like, you know, where trust and transparency are so crucial to long-term growth. Um, would you, who, anyone want to pick that up? We have uh, Justin or Mario. Yeah, Mario, if you want to start, go for it. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Uh, one thing that I've, I've noticed and that seems very important is democratization and ease of access for everyone. We see this a lot in investing, retail investors and access to cryptocurrency, but also just regular um, trades and transactions. So everybody is noticing what's going on, uh, whether it's brick and mortar financial services or some of these new offerings that fintech companies are providing. And I think that any way a company can look or uh, try to be inclusive is just going to benefit a large customer segment. Um, I just wanted to add on to this question, if you don't mind, before you go ahead, Justin. Also wanted to understand, like, in your opinion, how successful do you think that BFSI industries have been in actually embracing digital adoption? Because I think traditionally they've been a little more, you know, stringent or a little more like, uh, more prevalent towards the more traditional methods of banking. So just in your opinion, what do you think? Yeah, I, I actually think they've, from what I've seen, they're, they're definitely trying to embrace it by, by uh, Mario actually touched on it, in, enabling the, the usage of and leveraging the data that they're collecting. I think really looking at it at a diff, with a different lens and understanding some of those components of empathy, which is not a very operational way to, to run a business. It's digging a little bit deeper. And what is the data telling you about customer satisfaction when it comes to uh, uh, fees or certain components that might make their relationship a little more uh, full of friction? And I think there's something about looking at the data and making those changes, not only at an organizational level, but also at a frontline level and enabling that through coaching and, and training to really help their teams. And I think there's something there to be said about leveraging that data and making the team at the front lines have more visibility to it. Because if you're bought in at the front line instead of just at the leadership level, it tends to really um, go through the entire organization and that change happens a lot faster. And then the other thing I'd say is with that data, I, once again, Mario touched on the empathy piece and making some changes, but I think uh, you're seeing a switch from 
um, being a little less transactional to trying to be more educational. And what is that education that when you do interact with that customer that the data is telling you is valuable to communicate in that moment, whether it's navigation of the tools and solutions, whether it's policies and, and fees, um, whatever that is. And I think that switch to educational is how that, that data is informing them uh, to train and coach their, their people that are interacting with the customers. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, a point I would like to add here is uh, one of the things that customers definitely expect from us is about predictive analytics. So how you can, uh, you know, send them alerts, you know, kind of uh, understand what they are going through or they would face as challenges, uh, understand their usage patterns and then help them, you know, kind of predict how things are going to happen uh, as they move forward. So a lot of tools and technologies that are available in the market today, if we can implement and deliver on that, uh, that is what I think customers are expecting. Um, so also just coming back to that, right? Like we're saying that customers are looking for the solutions that can give them, you know, tailored made experiences. So can we talk about, you know, like how is FinTech and actually, you know, non-traditional players, how have they actually disrupted the CX landscape in the FinServe industry? And how are they, you know, showing customers, you know, you know, what kind of solutions they can expect, which is making them turn away from traditional banking services, banking and other financial services. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Ease of service is something that is definitely, you know, most of these non-traditional have come up on a technology background, uh, you know, so they have the advantage or they do not have the advantage of legacy. So they are able to, you know, leverage the technology to the most and deliver on the expectations, essentially being ease of use, ease of operations, ease of doing business. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would add to, you know, you're obviously thinking, when you think of non-traditional players, you're thinking of the millennial demographic, which is a large portion of these uh, new customers that are, that are going to more of the digital offerings. But there's definitely another demographic that are more of your traditional um, players in that space that are making that switch over there. And I think um, those are new eyes and ears to the, these types of solutions. And so it's very important that they understand like what are the the needs of those customers today they might uh, i think suas touched on it in terms of being more proactive with some solutions but what what is really important to them is it easy is it that ease of access is it understanding how to um do the transactions or the 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 actions that you're looking to complete to, to ultimately have your finances be in the place that you want them to or is it um, the humanization piece? Is it building a rapport? Is it building trust and credibility with that brand? Because with it being more digital, not having that humanized interaction, I think can definitely make you feel like you're a little bit further from the brand than previously uh, when you were in that space. So it's, it's really understanding that and with those new eyes and ears of the non-traditional players for sure. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, so, you know, so then it brings me to my next question, you know, I'm just wondering here, you know, when we talk about, you know, non-traditional players who are kind of redefining CX for a lot of financial in industries, does that mean that now the traditional banking services or financial services need to start investing in cloud technology? Is that now mandatory or, you know, compulsory, so to say, or, the, or does not having cloud-based technology or digital technology kind of keep you out of the game or push you back a little bit? Uh, essentially, I mean, just to start with, uh, you know, uh, nobody kind of uh, would disagree when we say that, you know, cloud is essential today, uh, especially given the last year where everybody is working from home, you know, the way cloud technologies have helped us, uh, you know, be there for our customers from anywhere we are, uh, you know, I think everybody would kind of agree that, yes, uh, cloud is, is essential to deliver the best of our services uh, to our customers. Okay. Uh, Mario, Justin, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, sure. Um, having worked in, in banking in the past and having gone through a transition of an older legacy support system to one that was based on the cloud, um, I, I definitely saw a lot of benefits to being a little bit more flexible. So we interacted with clients and the, the original system that we had worked for a very long time and um, my company built an in-house tool and we pulled 
what worked and we built upon that. So I, I think that the, the change is tough. It was not a smooth transition, um, but overall it gave our workers more flexibility. And after a year or a year and a half time, we, we saw higher turnaround, better turnaround and better satisfaction with our end clients. Makes sense. Cool. All right, so I think, you know, so far we've been touching upon so much of the customer experience and I must say we've gone pretty fast. So maybe we can spend a little more time on this. Um, we talk about customer experience so much, but there is another side to that story. And that is equally important, if not more, it is the employee experience, right? So how important is it to focus on that employee experience when you're trying to adopt new technology, when you're trying to, you know, get into a new sphere or take your company more digital, right? So, and how does that employee experience really impact your customer at the end of the day? So I think this is open to all panelists. I'm sure everyone can relate. Yeah, I'll, I can kick things off here. Thanks, Uhas. Um, so there is, when that initiative is the customer experience and making it so great, it tends to lend to over, overlooking the fact that who's delivering that great experience. That's the employees, it's the frontline teams. And so taking some of those best practices from how you care about your customers and a lot of the ways we talked about today, which is leveraging data, um, learning about what is the proper education and the right forms of communication in our now virtual world where a lot of people are working from home or working remote, you know, what is the best way that I can engage with, engage with my people that meet them at where they're at in terms of, is it over a, a platform like a Microsoft Teams or Slack? Is it over a Zoom face-to-face? -face? Um, is it over email? Everyone works very differently. And so finding the right balance there is so important because if you find that right balance from a communication standpoint, then you can start doing things like recognizing your people from, from implementing the right practices, right? So when you see great customer experience moments, when all these, all these different areas we touched on earlier about showing empathy with, with getting rid of fees and communicating that right to the customer, providing education on so software and solutions for your digital banking experience, how are you quickly recognizing that and reinforcing that with your teams? So that way, not only does that individual feel good about that, so they wanna repeat it, also the rest of the team sees examples of what that looks and sounds like. And so that goes back to leveraging the data in a way that doesn't just sit in, in leadership or in an insights role, but also gets down to the frontline teams. Um, so that type of same, same components of a great customer experience can still be applied to a great employee experience. And so, you know, the takeaway there is don't only look for the things that are not working, look for the things that are working and spotlight those through recognition programs and through rewarding um, so that the, the team knows what that looks and feels like. I think that that's always a, an important factor. Yeah, yeah, that makes uh, perfect sense, Justin. I mean, uh, so sort of we are essentially into rewards and recognition space for last decade or so. And we understand the uh, importance of recognition, understanding, and, you know, we believe in delivering instant uh, rewards, uh, you know, instant recognition, helping people celebrate, uh, you know, having a, post that has been posted in your internal social media where everybody can you know jump in and say hey congratulations well done and you also get some kind of monetary or non-monetary benefits along with it all these are very very uh, essential and uh, you know sometimes we do have you know like commission structures or whatever it is but they kick in at certain uh, you know later time during the year but if you have some smaller mechanisms of rewarding people instantaneously let like, hey you had an excellent call with the customer today the way you handled the customer was fantastic you know they really you really understood them and delivered them here is go get a coffee on me or whatever you know just like a way to make your teams uh, you know essentially very happy about what they have done these are the things that are definitely going to help them feel better about what they are doing and then perform uh, you know continue to deliver as uh, you know you would expect them to absolutely Maya? Sure, I can chime in as well. Uh, I definitely agree with the sentiment from Justin and Suhas. Um, one thing that I did wanna bring up too was when looking at employee satisfaction, um, coming from the bias of previous companies and 
trying to understand how we can automate things, whether it's um, routine automation or incorporating machine learning into automation. I think that's a great way to improve employee morale, especially um, some of our employees that feel like they're pressing too many buttons or um, clicking the same things over and over again, or just doing mundane tasks that aren't interesting to them. Um, a lot of different companies, including Freshworks, offer tools that support agents can use to help them automate those processes so that they can spend more of their time on more interesting tasks or talking to people and advising people like Justin talked about before, educating customers rather than just clicking a few buttons and telling them, all right, I, I did the one thing you needed to do. A robot could have done it, but hopefully you're satisfied. So I think that that is where the industry is moving. I think that the technology is is there in some spots and is getting there in others. And, you know, I've worked in those jobs before where you feel like half your day, you're just pushing buttons and, and doing stuff that isn't necessarily exciting. So um, Freshworks has a lot of different employee tools that um, can get those things done, not only more quickly, but more efficiently with, with you know, prone to less error. And I think that that's, that's something I always recommend to my customers when I talk to them at Freshworks is, consider these things because they're they're an investment, but um, they will make your employees much happier if we can get them running properly. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, one more point here I would like to add is uh, we also have something called as uh, where we run uh, pulse surveys, where we get kind of, you know, uh, request some kind of inputs from our employees to understand, you know, how, how, how they can do better, what the company can do better for them. So those kind of pulse surveys are also very important, uh, you know, to understand because these are front end people. They know exactly what the customer challenges they are facing, you know, so they can give the company more uh, inputs in terms of how to better the products, how to improve the services, what kind of processes to adopt to. So it's it's very, uh, you, know, you know, like in India, we are, you know, here we have something called as KYC, you can know your customer. Something similar we should also have at our end where, you know, you have like a KYE, you know, know your employees. So, you know, those kind of uh, ways to generate the information and help employees feel better is definitely going to be uh, important. Absolutely. I think we can all agree, right? Happy employee equals happy customer. And that's how it always should be, I guess. Um, so I actually want to bring, and I think, yes, one of our, um, our attendees has said the same thing. Happy employees lead to happy customers impacting the CX. So bang on. Um, so I think, you know, we've made good time. We've come to the last session of our discussion, last question of our discussion. Um, so at this time, I'd also like to remind all our, all our attendees, the Q&A widget is open and our panelists will be taking a few questions after we're done with the discussion. So please leave your questions and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible. Right. So bringing up the last, quest, the last question here, just want to get your insights, your professional insights and advice on what companies should look to prioritize to improve their CX in the, new, in the near future for the BFSI and FinTech sector. Um, I'll open this to all the panelists. We just want to hear, you know, whether it's adopting new tools or whether it is which tools you need to be looking at adopting, whatever you have to share for all of our attendees today. Yeah, I can kick that off. Thank, thank you, Nandita. I, I think, and this goes back to the company or the product that I support, Stella Connect, humanization is extremely important. So as you, as, as in the near future, with a lot of these people transitioning to these digital solutions, um, obviously, it's great to have automations and AI and chatbots because that will really help in, in the long term hit those low hanging fruit issues and really resolve them. But also, don't don't lose that one to one human to human contact, especially after the year we've been through being able to keep a phone. You know, phone calls can be expensive, but if it's within your realm of having that channel be available, you're going to see a lot more customers be more willing to make a phone call. Um, and how do you maximize those phone calls to make them as effective and, and frictionless for the customers as possible? But the value of having that human to human interaction, building that rapport, building that credibility, having that education provided via voice versus just the chat or a, a link to a certain help article in this near future, I think is really important. I wouldn't say that's the long term solution, as we know, um, more of the digital option or digital channels can be more cost effective. but 
getting people on board with the digital offerings, getting them to feel confident and about the security and privacy piece of it, right? Not everyone's excited to send an email with account information or financial numbers or over a chat. So that phone option does tend to ease that, that concern. And so my, my takeaway is the humanization piece is really important and using that customer feedback um, to really bring that to life. Why do the customers enjoy that? And you'll see it's because they like the person they talk to, they like their personality, their empathy, the way they listen um, and not having it feel so robotic at this stage during this transition. But definitely that would be uh, my, my biggest takeaway here is bring, keeping humanization alive uh, with those certain channels. I can go next, thanks, Justin. Uh, and then I just a segue with the humanization point. Um, in my experience, one of the best ways to provide that is to offer a chance to connect with your customers and, and all the channels that you think your customers are interested in, in reaching out to you. So whether that's email, chat, phone, WhatsApp, uh, Apple Business Chat, Facebook, Twitter, um, being able to support people in those spaces seems to be uh, something that a lot of my customers are interested in. And it seems to be something that they've seen success with. So Fresh Desk Omnichannel provides them with a lot of a, a lot of access into those channels without having their agents accessing Twitter and WhatsApp and pulling out their phone and going back and forth. Um, allows you to bring that all into one space. That way, if a customer comes back and they call you and they originally sent you a tweet, a, a direct message on Twitter, all of that information is provided to the agent. So they know what's going on. They understand the customer's journey and they're picking it up right where it left off. Um, that also goes along with the digital side too. So if you want to have chat bots embedded in websites, or if you wanna have um, conversational bots or even process oriented bots that walk people through self-service, all of that can be connected. So I think Freshdesk has, has a great offering there. Um, you know, I would always be interested in speaking to anybody if they want to hear more about it. Absolutely, absolutely. No, it makes perfect sense. You know, and while we deliver this omni-channel, we also, uh, you know, make sure that uh, you know it's a consistent experience across all these channels. So, you know, the customers uh, feel really great about it. So, yeah, the, I'm, I'm sure uh, you know the omni-channel experience is going to help us. And another aspect, you know, um, probably which has been working along is transparency. The you know the more transparent you are with customers, of front you are with them i think uh, recent situations have helped them you know that kind of just reduces the anxiety so it, it just works great for all so that's that's uh, all from my side great all right thank you everyone um, i think those are some great insights from our panelists and um, you know just before we go into the live q and a um, we're just going to have a quick poll. We've talked about a bunch of solutions here today. We've talked about Zozo Day, we've talked about Seller Connect by Medallia, and we've talked about Freshdesk. If anyone attending here today would like to know more about any of these solutions or these products, um, we have a quick poll running. You can let us know and we'll reach out to you after the session is done. Um, again, once again, anyone has any questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A bot, um, in the Q&A widget. I see that you know we have a few questions in the chat and a few questions uh, in the visit as well. So I think this is a comment to one of the statements that we had we made while we were having a discussion. It's from Arjun and he says, you know, when engagements shift from education to transactional, aren't we moving to more operational centric approach than being customer centric? And then that might, uh, you know, impact customers' expectations and, you know, they might have short term and not uh, long term expectations. Does anyone want to, it's not really a question, but uh, if anyone wants to add on to that or clarify what we mean by that. Yeah, I can, I can take a stab at it. Um, so I think there's something to be said about not being educational unless the customer wants that education and asks for that. So I think the, the soft skills and understanding and listening and asking the right questions from a training standpoint allows um, that type of approach to really be effective. If it's just a one-way conversation of here's how you do this and here's what you need to do, that mm -hmm. can definitely remove that customer engagement. And I think that you don't want to go too far down that road, but you do want to listen for where there's an opportunity to provide 
best practices or tips or, you know, easy navigation solutions that, like I said, at this stage, when so much has shifted, um, it's, it's better to know more now than, than go too long and, and have that snowball into bigger issues where people just leave because they don't feel like they're getting the, the resources that they need. But you can't, you can't proactively provide education unless someone asks for it or you're hearing the right types of uh, keywords or questions that really drive that. So I would definitely preface it with that because at the end of the day, the customer uh, engagement piece is extremely key and, and keeping, um, keeping it customer centric because customer centric means listening, not only talking, but listening as well. So it's a two way uh, dynamic there. And I think, you know, also we talked so much about how customers' attention spans have gone down so much. And if they feel that, you know, they're, you're, they're, we're talking a lot and not really listening to what they want or answering the questions that they want, I think that might also impact their CX, like, in a bad way. Right? Cool. All right. So we have another yeah. question. Uh, sorry, did you want to add something? No, no, that's perfect. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Um, we've got another question here. Um, give me one second. So someone's saying, I manage a company with less than 10 support agents. Do you think investing in digital services like AI or cloud will be worth it in terms of ROI? So Hush, do you want to take a stab at this? Uh, oh, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, this is like, uh, what do you say? Uh, definitely must, yes. Uh, we have to invest uh, because that is how we are going to grow. Uh, you know, the scalability, the instantaneous response that is requested by our customers. We need support, and if we have uh, you know cloud-based solutions which are you know up to the latest uh, you know technologies and features that we need, uh, those are going to help us scale very fast. So yeah, there is like no two ways about it. Absolutely. I think, I think I'd also add to, and I agree with Suhas, I think that that is extremely imperative. Um, there's a balance of, you gotta be careful not to just throw more, more technology at potential issues at that stage of the game when you're small, really understanding the true, the true um, issues that you're coming up against and how those automations or how those solutions will, will help you. Uh, because the more, more technology you introduce and the more um, the more nuances your, your team has to manage, that's more training, that's more coaching. And that, that just becomes something that could be overwhelming at that point of an early team about, of about 10 people. Um, so getting a really good foundation in place for why you're adding those solutions and also making those solutions concise. I've, I've, I've worked with a lot of clients over the years that add and add more, more of these types of cloud-based solutions that really are trying to help grow their CX program. And then they're working with six different vendors across six different initiatives. And it becomes, to Mario's point, you become clicking more buttons and actually taking the actions or executing like you need to. So how do you do that in a consolidated and concise way that has your, your employees feeling excited and motivated about the tools they're gonna to be working in, but also at the end, having it be most viable for the customer experience in an efficient, in an efficient way. So definitely something that's important it's just making sure that the the roots are in place and the foundation is strong and understanding what your path of growth is going to look like absolutely uh, we've got another question here from josh and he asked that if we talk about humanization would you say those brands that have a high degree of it will score over companies that don't also will this help non-legacy companies play catch up with legacy companies and how does this play out in terms of brand preference? Anyone want to take a step? Yeah, Mario. Can you can you repeat the the first part of the question about humanization and how that impacts is a brand yeah. awareness? The, so they want they're asking like you know how much does humanization impact on the kind of degree or the score that a company would get right like would you prefer companies that have a higher uh, you know humanization score or lower humanization score I think essentially also will it help non legacy companies kind of catch up with legacy companies if there is more humanization yeah I guess I would take this up from the approach of a, a customer myself and what I what I prefer so. Obviously, mm -hmm. preferences vary wildly, but I think that it's a very important piece. It's definitely not the only piece. 
um, if I'm interacting with someone and I want them to help me, maybe I've spent money there and I, and I think that something needs to be done to, to right an issue that I, I've been wronged. Mm -hmm. Humanization is, is important, but for me personally, what's most important is finding a resolution. So obviously I, I want someone who I can relate with, but um, I do think sometimes I've seen companies focus more on the humanization and, and not so much on finding a resolution. And, and at times that can be frustrating. So I think it's important to balance both. And just to kind of follow up on that, like, do you think that this impacts brand preference? Also, do you think that people are willing to pay more if they believe that a particular brand offers that kind of service, more human service? Do you think that factors in as well? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. I mean, many of our customers uh, who have kind of switched from their older vendors, you know, to, to us, uh, they have definitely told us that, uh, you know, customer service has helped us uh, differentiate ourselves. Uh, so it, it's definitely matters. Uh, the more, uh, you know, faster, better you can help customers uh, throughout their journey, the more business you're going to get. Yeah, and I'll actually, Mario, I think you did a great job of saying, like, I, I threw, I've been throwing out that word humanization a lot, and I think it's a very, very broad term. It, it, mm -hmm. it obviously resonates with thinking about human-human interaction, but you have to be able to execute that with the very solutions-oriented team, right? Just by having someone to talk to doesn't mean that's going to make the customer happier. That that person, the, the CX representative needs to, to have the tools in place to answer the questions needed. They need to have the training of listening for the right things as well as asking the right questions. And then also realizing that, you know, every customer will be coming from a different place. And that's the nuance of human to human interaction is it's two people connecting. So how, how do you audible in a conversation? How do you change direction if things are going a certain route when you have more of a chat bot or something a little more automated that's going to go through its process and procedures um, how does that human human add value, not, not detract value. And I think putting the right systems in place that make the, the CX reps job easier, but also having the training in play of how do you talk to someone? And that's why you hear, you know, having service experience at restaurants and hospitality allows you to have experience some more of those interactions so that if you ever do take a job in customer experience, especially in a FinTech world, um, you're, you're used to what responses you might get when you present a solution or when you ask a question. And so, you know, just saying humanization, I think is, is a broad approach, but it's, it's the right avenue. It's just how you go about executing on it to, to make the, the CX rep that uh, well-equipped to manage those interactions. That's it, just a, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think one last question before we all sign off, right? In BFSI, there are often many intermediaries involved in a single transaction or customer request. So how do companies work together, given that they might be operating on different CXM and CRM platforms to deliver the most frictionless experience to customers? Yeah. I, I can take a stab at this one. I've worked with, uh, you know, insurance industry, which is kind of notoriously known for its legacy systems uh, and, you know, having a desperate system because it has essentially grown up with a lot of mergers and acquisitions. So, you know, every company has different systems and then you merge all these companies together. But what we have seen is most of the customers, uh, you know, that we have worked with uh, work on some kind of a unified platform, a unified customer view kind of project where, you know, you either deploy a new cloud-based solution or you build it and like a homegrown application where you get a single view of customers across the applications, you know, that you have, be it be billing system, be it be, you know, whatever customer support system so that when uh, your customer support team are, they are talking to the customer, they get a single view of the customer, not just, you know, uh, a siloed view uh, so that, that, that is very essential. That's what I've seen. Mario, Justin, anything to add? Yeah, I'll go next. Thanks, Suhas. Um, definitely a lot of industries, I think, on top of insurance have that problem. Um, even companies, right, internally, sometimes you have a, a huge issue with different tools and information's in one place and it's not in the other place or it's in two places and it's different. And nobody knows what the right answer is. So um, integrations are incredibly important. 
Um, you know, a lot of cloud-based SaaS tools will have a marketplace. And I think that that's the first stop if you have, or you're working with someone that has all this information in one area and it needs to get somewhere else. Any kind of integration that is already out there, I would recommend leveraging that. Um, if there's nothing already out there, you can always hire someone to build a custom integration. The cost sometimes scares people, but when you think about how much time it's gonna save, you can usually justify it. If not, and you have to go like the old school route of just sending emails to other people and, and someone sends an email and someone else reads the email and types the information in, um, that's still very present. You know, we do that sometimes. I have customers that do that. It's not ideal, but um, we see it a lot, right? It, it's a hard thing to, to nail down. So um, I, I think integrations can be built and I, and I normally recommend them if we're getting the right thing done. But if somebody has to suck it up and, and <laughs> just do data entry, um, sometimes that's the only way to get it done. Absolutely. All right. Um, I think that brings us to the end of this session. Uh, I'm sorry, Justin, did you have anything to add or are you good with that answer? No, I'm great. Great, great feedback okay. there. Thank you. All right. Um, oh, I think we've got a last question is any idea of how you can support how government support government organizations can enhance the ads. Um, I think that's a bit of a broad question. So if anyone has any ideas from the top of the head, we can answer that, or uh, we'll get back to you over email. Does anyone have anything on top of the head? Otherwise, we can answer later. I, I do work with um, a lot of government organizations, usually municipal level or um, education, right? So public universities. And I, I did think that there would be a lot of differences in how they operate and what their goals are compared to the private sector. Um, at least in, in IT help desk world, um, it doesn't vary as much. So I would be interested in, in hearing more about the, the specific goals that you have that are different and that you're struggling to um, you know, be able to support. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely a different segment of people are contacting if it's city hall or the transportation unit of a, of a city or something like that. Um, but but I, I've noticed that there, there is a significant amount of overlap in a lot of the tools that I've worked with and that we offer at Freshworks. We, we do see a lot of success with government organizations. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the aspects that make much more sense for government is like a sentiment analysis. So what people are saying and what are the sentiments behind that, those kind of tools also help, uh, you know, probably more towards because it's just the sheer volume of, uh, you know, the feedback that you would get on anything that you deliver. Right? So it's, I'm sure it's interesting. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Perfect. All right. Um, yeah, I think we're done answering all the questions. Um, so thank you so much to all our panelists for joining us today. I'm sure your insights will have a huge impact on all our attendees as well. And thank you to all our attendees for joining us. I hope we get the chance to host you again sometime near in the future. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. All right. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Nanita. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, appreciate right. it. Bye for now. Bye. 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 Bye.